times of war, the United States government has maintained that it can limit the freedoms of the people in order to protect the interests of the nation as a whole. This policy, however, is one that has been met with controversy over the years. The Frank Lamont disbarment trial is an example of the local legal society participating in this national legal issue. The year was 1917. World War I had just begun for the United States. People from the Evansville area were preparing to go to war. Along with the war came an outpouring of support for American troops as well as the fear of anti-American thought. It was in response to this fear that Congress introduced the Espionage Act. Well, if you were opposed to the war, the best thing you can do was keep your mouth shut because we didn't allow for opposition to the war. The federal government passed the Espionage Act, uh, which outlawed any uh, uh, anti-war talk. Uh, but even the local administration under, under in their bossy uh, passed an ordinance that was, I think, supplied to them by the federal government that uh, made it illegal to end the laws, the ordinances, wording, slur the uh, flag or the president. One case involving the Espionage Act in Evansville was that of Frank Sheldon Lamont. Frank S. Lamont was born December of 1883 in St. Paul, Minnesota. He studied law at Mankato, Minnesota, where he graduated in 1907 at the age of 23. In 1914, Lamont began practicing law in Indianapolis, Indiana. He then moved to Evansville in August of 1916. Mr. Lamont, the socialist candidate for mayor of Evansville at the time, was allegedly guilty of inciting anti-American sentiment during six speeches during the summer of 1917. One of these speeches occurred in Elberfeld, Indiana on the 5th of August. Lamont had just finished his speech and returned to his car with his wife and child when on a rural road another vehicle pulled next to the Lamont and someone in the vehicle motioned him to pull over. The six men in the vehicle were intent on lynching Lamont. Lamont was chased by the men for some time before he stopped and helped his wife and child from the car. The Lamonts went to a farmhouse and hid there while the lynchers kept driving on the road. The Lamonts would-be lynchers were upset with Mr. Lamont's socialistic views and believed that he had encouraged young men to avoid the draft. The lynchers, however, were not the only ones upset with Mr. Lamont's socialistic viewpoint. Many attorneys in Evansville did not want their profession associated with someone of Lamont's political views. They also thought that Lamont had violated the oath of the bar in which he had agreed to uphold the laws and the Constitution of the United States. This led to a movement to remove Lamont from the bar. Lamont was called to answer charges at the Vandenberg County Courthouse on September 13, 1917. After a change of venue, Lamont's trial began in Boonville on October 27. The court made sure that the jury was patriotic and that no socialists were admitted. As a result, the jury was made up mostly of American-born farmers. During the trial, Mr. Lamont did his best to persuade the jury that he was pro-American. He told the jury that he believed the United States should win. He also argued that the cost of the trial was preventing him from buying a Liberty Bond. Lamont, however, was unsuccessful in persuading the jury. He was officially disbarred on the 3rd of November. During the trial, however, Lamont was still the socialist candidate for mayor of Evansville. Lamont who received most of his backing for proponents of organized labor and the railroad, lost the mayoral race to Benjamin Bossie and A.R. Messick. Lamont had 2,514 votes. Messick had 4,444 votes. And Benjamin Bossie had 7,602 votes. Though he did not win the election, the amount of support that Lamont received was significant given his ideology and the political climate of the day. Lamont being disbarred uh, for his stance against the, the draft really isn't that surprising. 
um, public officials had been forced to resign their offices and and anybody that was you know not deemed patriotic enough uh, was a target so I don't think it's a condemnation of the bar for disbarring him um, I think it's it's more uh, uh, speaks to the sort of the the time uh, I think the bar as the as the courts as the Supreme Court as as our politics always have reflect to a certain extent the sentiment at that time and, and there was a real strong public sentiment in during World War one that uh, you needed to support the war I think you you can't look at what it says about freedom of speech in this country it says what did it say about freedom of speech in the time of war particularly World War one uh, that was a unique unique time the federal government assumed power that they would never have been able to have in, in peacetime. Uh, and actually, I think we learned some things from the, uh, uh, the actions in World War I and even in World War II. We didn't put the same kind of restraints to the same degree as we did in World War I. But the idea was that uh, the government had a right to protect itself and uh, eliminate any kind of threat to the war effort. And Interestingly enough, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the Supreme Court agreed. In 1919, there was a case where the Supreme Court said freedom of speech is not absolute, but rather the individual's freedom of speech is secondary to the well-being of the country. And so the courts agreed that it was okay to limit that sort of, uh, of expression during the time of the war.